have it or we all right well good morning everybody We're about to get started on day two of our orange senior presentation we had a great day yesterday so thanks to everybody who presented yesterday topic is hybrid learning and technology solutions, so I'll let you explain a little bit more. How about a big hand for next, please? to you in the form of a Zoom meeting because since March 13th, 2020, life in the United States and around the globe has taken a turn that no one thought possible. And while things seem to be getting closer to pre-pandemic times, studies and numerous articles depict our future being full of online-based learning, teaching, and collaboration. In order to combat these difficulties, I interned with a group of people determined to make life go on as much as possible in lieu of these uncertain times. Jeffrey Hernandez, my internship mentor, is one of the team leads for Ultra Camp, an event hosted by the Virginia District Church of the Nazarene on their campground in Buckingham, Virginia. I spent four days there with little sleep and over 200 other teenagers determined to spread the love of Christ to them through whatever means possible. Under his instruction, I assisted with the running of technology of all kinds. After completing my internship, my project took a complete turn from working on the stage and its components when I was approached by the head of technology for the Orange County Public Schools, Mr. Alton. He made me aware of some issues where teachers were teaching online students and in-person students at the same time. In this instance, we'll call that hybrid learning. And told me that we were looking for a solution that solved three simple problems. Make it so the online students can see the whiteboard, the in-person students can see the teacher's screen, and the teacher can see and hear the online students. In order to complete all of those basic principles, we came up with a system which I refer to as the demo setup. It is comprised of an ATEM Mini for the video, a camera for the whiteboard, a Mac Mini and display for the meeting, and a connection for the presentation from the teacher's computer. And the best part is, totaling just over $3,000, this hybrid learning setup is affordable and can be replicated throughout Orange County schools to facilitate hybrid learning. Okay, that's all I have for you guys. I'm now going to pass it over to in-person Nick. Thank you, Google Meet Nick. You're very welcome, and good luck. Well, I'm going to go back to the beginning. In fifth grade was the first time I became interested in technology. And that was when my mom became a children's pastor. I started working with her and with our church to run all of the equipment for children's church. And I eventually stepped it up and I ran in the big leads at the adult services. During COVID, I started off with this event here. You can see we ran an outside event. Uh, that was a lot of fun and it really got me into live streaming and technology and helping people with unusual circumstances. So during my internship, what I did was I worked with Jeffrey Hernandez and I primarily ran the sound and lights at Ultra Camp in July of 2021. There were 248 other teenagers there. We had 72 hours. I got 26 hours of internship from that and only 10 hours of sleep. So it was a long three days. This is a picture we took at the end. You can see me in the middle. Just to the left, that is Jeffrey, my internship mentor. And those people on the left of him are some of the other support staff that I worked with. I was then getting ready to come back to school and work with Mr. Crystal on the stage when I was approached by Mr. Outen. He was looking for a solution 
to uh, Mr. Weinstead's problem. He is our only chemistry teacher here in the high school, meaning he had a lot of students to get through his classes. He had to teach an online group of students as well as an in-person group of students at the same time. And what he was doing was using this meeting service, this, this setup that we developed at the beginning of COVID, which was functional but basic. The problem is with the external display as well as the teacher's computer, you could show the presentation on the Google Meet and in the classroom at the same time, but the problem was teachers were using iPads instead of the whiteboard to write information, and if students wanted to see that information in the classroom, they had to join the Google Meet as well. And as you can see, our one little tiny Wi-Fi router is not really capable of handling that throughout the school. So we developed this system. This is the hybrid system, or what I call the demo setup. It has an external screen just like normal, but we added all of this stuff. This stuff is very confusing when you look at it, but it's just an A10 mini, a nice little computer, and that all went to Google Meet, and it allowed them to use the camera over there to display the whiteboard. So let's actually take a look at that in action. This is the most recent picture I have. Oh, hold on. We then decided to order all of the stuff. We put it together, and this is the most recent image I have of the demo setup. As you can see, a student thought it would be a good idea to put something on the screen, so we went with the fire. So let's take a look. Currently, the demo setup has a couple extra cameras to help me demonstrate it. We have a computer camera, which is from my computer or a teacher's computer in that case. There's a wide angle camera, which this would typically be the whiteboard, but in this case, you can see a comprehensive view of everything going on over here at the demo setup. There's a computer. This is another computer. This would normally be running Google Meet, but for, the, for this case, I didn't want to run it to bog down our internet for no reason. And then we have an ATEM Mini here, which controls all of the video switching. If I switch to three, which wouldn't normally be here, you can see a zoomed in view. This is the ATEM Mini. It basically has a bunch of buttons. Mr. Weinset didn't end up having to use most of those buttons. It was pretty simple. He just had to click between the computer and the wide or whiteboard screen. So if we go back to the computer, you can see for my research, what I did was I into the different types of online-based learning, and we determined which one was best for students and teachers. There are three main types. Asynchronous learning involves the teacher sending out work to students and possibly including videos for the students to watch. As soon as they watch that, they can do their work. The slightly better version is synchronous learning, which includes sending out the work and getting on meetings with them at least once a week to discuss the work and teach them in person and get feedback. The last type is hybrid learning, which I believe, and studies have shown, is the best method of learning. It enables students to be in the classroom once a week, as well as meeting online, possibly. And it allows them to just get a one-on-one -on -one experience with the teacher that Google Meet just can't provide. So during this experience, I had a decent amount of free time, as we had a lot of time in between setup and when this presentation is. So I spent a lot of that time working with other groups, such as the band. Before COVID, we didn't worry about live streaming, but in lieu, or during COVID, we had to worry about live streaming. So what we did was I brought in some of my own equipment and I advised the band boosters on what they should purchase if they want to continue offering live streaming to other groups. For the athletics, I brought some lights to the last game. I had a really great, I had really great feedback from that. Actually, I got some school board members who said that they liked that. And Mr. Neely is also looking into possibly purchasing some of these to improve their games and improve student uh, participation. I also had music. And uh, we have a completely uh, legitimate broadcast. I actually have gotten <laughs> feedback from teachers that instead of them making the students watch, the students have been asking to watch the broadcast recently, which I am really glad about. <laughs> yeah, you can see we had some odd times going on. So let's talk about my future. Well, actually, let's talk about now. So last night, I was in Charlottesville setting up for an event that I will be running this weekend for the Virginia District Church of the Nazarene. Here is a crude photo of me kind of in the middle of setup. And I'm headed back there right after I finish presenting today. But in the fall, I'm going to be attending CMC semester 41. And I'm one of the 35 students there at a technical school. They have a semester-long program. If you have any questions about that, feel free to come see me afterwards. 
this is a pretty exciting uh, experience for me. Okay, that is all I have. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, so working at the uh, at the the district retreat center, uh, that was my first time working with an actual full size band. So I had to learn mixing and all of that kind of basic stuff. Uh, also, we had kind of more advanced stuff than I've used before. We have like subwoofers and stuff for like lower instruments. So I had to learn how to separately send signals to the subwoofers as well as uh, EQ everything to make sure there's no like ringing or frequency issues. Okay, so this is pretty simple at this point. What you're seeing on this screen would be the same exact thing as the students see online. So if we take a look at the wide view, what's going on is this is just using, this computer just sees this as an external display. So if you open up like uh, Google Slides or Microsoft PowerPoint, then what it does is it displays the second screen or your presentation directly to that. And you can use Airtame at the same time to display to an external monitor. <laughs> Big words. Um, but in terms of things, basically, if when Mr. Weinset goes to start his meeting in the morning, he opens up Google Meet, he starts his meeting, and then his camera is on, and he's ready to go. It, yeah, so it's a little hard to set up to begin with. And there were a couple quirks, like uh, Google Meet default mirrors video. So you know, when you look in a mirror, you move left, it moves left. A camera works opposite that. And so Google Meet mirrors that, but if you're trying to show text on a screen, you can't read it. So what they had to do is we had to find an extension that fixes that. That's only a problem on Mr. Winesett's side, not on the other side. Absolutely. Just like clip it like that. All right. Maybe I can just like hook it. Thank you. <laughs> I think so. I'm excited. Just a little. Just hoping everything goes well. <laughs> uh, so just hit the button for it. Okay. Is this the right clicker? Oh, okay, I was like, this looks really yeah, it looks cool. confusing. <laughs> what we were thinking, yeah, I thought the same thing too, yeah. That should be a lot of Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Should I just set this to, to this side? My name is Natalie Pettigen, and I decided to do my project on the dangers of skin cancer. If anybody in this room knows somebody who has been affected by skin cancer or has personally been affected, could you please raise your hand? As you can see, many of your peers and teachers have been affected or know somebody, and it is a problem that needs to be addressed in the day-to-day -day basis. For this, I decided to do this because growing up, I was always out in the sun, and as a result, my mom was very persistent with our own skin cancer awareness and making sure we have sunscreen on the regular. So in the summer when I worked as a lifeguard, I was able to see how my peers and colleagues and anybody who just came to use the pool, they didn't constantly reapply their sunscreen or even wear it at all or wear some protectant clothing. This worried me because they didn't understand the dangers that they were putting themselves in. For my, the reason I decided to do this topic, I said, I want to focus on a specific group. So I did, what are the best ways to prevent skin cancer in teenagers? This way I have a stronger connection with who I'm talking to, so I'll have a stronger outlet and I can really focus on spreading awareness throughout the schools. Throughout my project, I learned exactly how dangerous the sun really is. There are three different types of radiation that are produced by the sun that affect us on a day-to-day -day basis. It's UVA, UVB, and UVC. They all have different frequencies and they go into your skin at different rates. So UVA penetrates your skin the deepest, which usually leads to melanoma, which is a very aggressive form of skin cancer. Thankfully, the ozone layer blocks the majority of this radiation out. UVB and UVC usually affects us, which cause squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma, which is a common and not too aggressive form of skin cancer. I also found exactly how dangerous tanning beds are. Tanning beds use UVA light, which is the very dangerous one that really goes into your dermis and causes melanoma. Especially when your skin has no resilience buildup because you're not exposed on a day-to-day -day basis, you're very prone to developing skin cancer from it. When you're younger, your skin is more prone to skin cancer and skin damage because you have no built-up resilience to it, as I've said before, and it's just more likely to become mutated. In other countries, tanning beds are becoming more outlawed for younger students, like 18 and under, they usually don't want them to use tanning beds because it's so dangerous. In the United States, it varies from state to state on how these laws work, but in Virginia, you have to be, if you're 16 through 18, you have to be accompanied by an adult, and you can only use it once a year, and if you're 15 and under, you have to have signed permission by a parent or your guardian, and you have to be accompanied by um, them when you get your visit done. For my internship, I w went to Defy Metastetics, here I learned a different point of skin cancer and how it has long-term effects on your patients. When you have skin cancer, it usually has to be cut out of your skin and as a result, it can leave scars, mostly on your face because that's where skin cancer develops a lot because you're always exposed on your face in the sun. I would listen to consultations about patients, how they had deep scars in their face and they wanted to have them removed because it affects their day-to-day -day life because it's how people perceive them. I did my internship with Ms. Ingram, who is the owner of this business, and she is the main esthetician. She taught me how the sun can also cause early aging to your skin because it breaks down the tissue underneath, and it just gives your skin an overall lower appearance, which most people don't want to have fine wrinkles, so they usually come to her and they can have plasma done. Plasma rebuilds the tissue underneath your skin and can fix scars that you do have in your face and can also fix fine wrinkles. I was also able to learn about other medical procedures that weren't related to skin cancer but were still interesting to learn about, such as cool sculpting, which is where they freeze fat cells and they get flushed out by your lymphatic system over time. For my community service, I'm going to be working with Ms. Phillip, who's helping me create a lesson plan that will be taught in her classroom. This will be taught to the DE Anatomy and Physiology class at the end of the year. Throughout my presentation, I go through normalities in the skin, such as freckles, moles, and birthmarks. This is so you know what to look for on your skin, and if you see something that you think is abnormal, you can relate back to what you learned and be, reassure yourself. I also go over the abnormalities. 
such as the ABCDEs of melanoma. This stands for asymmetry, border, color, diameter, and evolving. This is what you should look for in your skin and possibly see a doctor if you have any of these symptoms. It's also important to have a yearly visit with your doctor, especially if you're more prone to sunburns or you have a lot of freckles and moles. I also go over what you use for protection from the sun, such as the two different types of sunscreen. Sunscreen has chemical and mineral. Those are the two different types. So chemical sunscreen, it absorbs the radiation and it's less effective because it lets more light through to your skin. While mineral sunscreen, such as zinc, which you'll see colored, so it's more marketable, and more people want to wear it on their face, so it's more protective. It reflects the radiation from you, and as a result, it blocks out more because it's not even letting it get near your skin. I also go over the different types of sun protectant clothing. Um, most people don't know that the two colors have different effects. Colors like blue are more effective because it has more reflective properties to the light that comes from the sun. And yellow lets more light through and therefore it's less effective because it gets to your skin more. And it's important to use because it's like a second layer of defense to your skin and as a result it's like it's a layer of defense. You don't have to have as much radiation hitting your skin. Things I've learned from this experience. I've learned to be more forward with what I need from when speaking to adults. I'm usually a very passive person so it was very nerve-wracking for me reaching out asking for internships, especially because I had to talk to facilities for like dermatologists. I was turned down many times, so it made me very discouraged, but I was able to work at a medical facility with a cosmetologist side instead. So it worked out in my favor, but it's really made me stronger with saying what I need from adults. Experience I've learned from this that I'd like to pass down to younger students is pictures, pictures, pictures. <laughs> I didn't realize how much you needed pictures for the entire project because you really need to show what you have learned and it's basically evidence of what you have done. And it's also really important to throughout the summer try and get a lot done because senior year does pile up and it becomes very stressful and hectic and it's just nice to have some of it out of the way. It's also good to have A, B, and C plans because for me I wanted to go and work at a facility for dermatologists but that didn't work out for me so I went to my second best option which would be working at a cosmetologist with a cosmetologist. And I had a, another plan, because that almost fell through also, where I would be taking a course learning about skin protection. For my future plans, I would like to study at VCU and become a pre-med student and eventually become a dermatologist. This way I can spread awareness and help people who are affected by it. This concludes my presentation. Any questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's illegal for young children to use them. Sorry. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> no? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Is that good? Is it good right here?
Where? Where on the computer? Right side. I think in the computer. Yeah, yeah, you got it now. I'm good. I'm not gonna fidget. You're not gonna fidget. I'm just gonna like, you know, use my hands. Hello everybody and good morning. My name is Ryder Rose and this is my senior internship project. For my project, I decided to do physical training and specifically injury prevention and post-COVID recovery. There we go. Um, so as many as my peers probably, I really struggled to find a topic at first. I was going through all sorts of scenarios of what I've done in the past, what, I've done, what I'm doing now, classes that I've taken. And there's one thing that has connected all of them and that's sports. I've been doing sports ever since I was a little kid, about four or five years old, and it's always played a big role in my life. I've played all sorts, of, all sorts of sports, ranging from football to basketball to track, and it's always had a big part in developing my leadership skills. So, I thought this would be a great topic for me to do. To start the project, me and my community service partner, Paul Poirier, sent an email, to, sent an email out to a few of the local gyms in the area and asked if we could go intern there. These gyms included Next Move CrossFit, Anytime Fitness, and Orange Chiropractic. Luckily for us, all these gyms answered, and this was a big relief for me because I was struggling to find a place where I could intern because I've sent out a few emails to places before, but unluckily, it didn't pan out. First, we have Anytime Fitness. Anytime Fitness was the first place that we really went to go intern. Me and Paul went and had a meeting with the gym owner, Jill Crowder, and we asked her a bunch of questions about uh, what the gym did during COVID, what it did after COVID, how they got people to come back, uh, what they did to keep people to stay. And I wrote all these down, all the questions, all the answers, and I used this for my research project. So that was really, uh, this was a really big part of my research. 
then she got us in contact with uh, the gym manager, Adriana Draper. Um, I emailed back and forth with her, and we managed to get a time together in which I could intern with her. As I was walking in, I was really nervous. This isn't my first time doing something like this, and I've never done it before. But when I got in there, luckily for me, she was very nice and very easy to come up to. As I was there, I did lots of things, but the main thing I did was clean. There always seemed like there was some new equipment which I had to wipe down, and I was the person to do it. Also something we did there was she showed me the group work that she does, and she showed me what they did in those group works. Uh, lastly, I asked her a lot of questions about what it was like being a college student fresh out of school and into the workforce, and she gave me some great advice. And that advice was to always go into something that you want to go into, because you don't want to be stuck in a job that you hate. Next, there's Next Move CrossFit. This gym means a lot to me because it's owned by my father, but unfortunately I wasn't able to intern under him, so I un interned under one of his employees, Jennifer Taylor. I've known Jennifer for a long time, and she's always been a good friend of the family, but I never really saw eye to eye with her and talked to her as an adult. But as I was interning here with her, I actually talked to her as an adult, and this was the first time I felt like I was an employee at a business. While we were there, she trained people that were lower on the athletic spectrum, and it was really cool to see how she took workouts from being high intensity and bringing them down to more low intensity. And this was really cool for me to see because usually I'm in the high intensity group. I really recommend you come to this gym. They recently transferred to a CrossFit gym, so if that's what you're looking for, I recommend going there. Next is Culpeper for Sports and Fitness Center. As I was interning at Next Move CrossFit, the gym owner, Ron Rose, came up to me and got me in contact with the owner here, or one of the trainers here, Marcus Haywood. Uh, I emailed back and forth with him uh, with the contact information that I got, and we also got to get a meeting together in which I could go and intern with him. As I was walking in, this was even more nerve-wracking for me because I knew that I was going to have to in actually interact with the people that he was interacting with. And this was the first time I did that because it's much unlike uh, Anytime Fitness. When I got there, I looked around, and I didn't see anybody that really looked like a trainer. So I went up to the biggest guy that I saw, and I went and introduced myself, and I was hoping that it was him, and luckily it was. <laughs> Um, this was really cool for me to see because he was just dressed in normal clothing and not like an actual gym trainer. And that's what I feel like a trainer should be. It's something that you can confine your trust in, and it seemed like they trusted the, him a lot. Another cool thing that I saw him do was he had multiple groups going on at one time. So he had a group of two people, a group of one person, and like a class of ten. And he managed to bounce back and forth between all of these groups. And, see, and uh, he, he, excuse me, uh, he seemed like he knew what he was doing that entire time. Uh, so that was really awesome for me to see. Lastly is Orange Chiropractic. I had no clue what I was doing going into this one because this was completely different from all the other ones. Uh, but luckily when I got in there, uh, my mentor, Eileen Wallen, she was a very nice person and she was actually very intelligent. When I got there, she sat me down in this room and gave me an amazing informational presentation about the spinal system and the nervous system and it was really cool. She thinks of the body as a computer or the body's natural IT system. You have your brain, you have your nerves, you have your bones, your blood, your muscles, all working in conjunction with each other, just like a computer does. Uh, after she gave me this, it was, excuse me, um, this was really cool for me to see because I'm usually not very interested in topics that I'm learning about, but it seemed like I was actually interested in learning about this and wanted to know more. After we did this, she took a patient back to the rehab part, and he had a, he had a hurt shoulder, and he, she worked on developing that shoulder back. This was another cool, uh, this is another cool way of how she developed people back up. Next is my community service. For my community service, I partnered up with my classmate, Paul Poirier, to put together a program called Get Fit. This Get Fit program would be a week long of lessons and workouts in which people can participate in for a short amount of time in their homes by themselves. Starting with the lessons plan. For example here, Monday is self-motivation. You can click on that link there, and it'll give you, uh, it'll send you to the lesson plan, in which there's a video and a short paragraph in which you can read and watch and learn about self-motivation. This is intended for people to just go and watch for 10 to 20 minutes and not waste too much time. Along with these lessons, there will be uh, videos of workouts for each time. For example here, this is Wednesday's workout, which is a leg workout. We, as you see, we have stretches and we have workouts, and we have videos to go with each one. Also, we have intermediate and assisted levels so that people of all ranges can do the workouts. Yeah. Um, next for my legacy. The legacy that I want to give beh leave behind in the community is to get people fit again, as the community service title entails. I want to get the community back into gyms because ever since the COVID lockdown, people have been slow to get back into the fitness community. And it's really cool to see how it's grown since the uh, COVID-19 lockdown. My future plans. 
I plan on attending Bridgewater College and running track and field there, along with majoring in health and exercise science. This was really convenient for me because they reached out to me for track and field, and it turns out they had an amazing health and exercise science program, along with a coaching program that I can go into for a secondary. Advice that I have for the next generation. Time management. I know that everybody preaches about time management, but I feel like I'm one of the worst procrastinators in the world. I always have to do things last minute, and it's really a struggle for me. Luckily for me, I had Ms. Carlton and Ms. Hernan to set checkpoint, checkpoints for this project, or else I probably would have been wrapping it up all in the last week or two. Next is to choose a topic that you really want to do. As my uh, mentor, Adriana Draper, said, you always want to choose a topic that you, or you always want to choose a field that you want to go into and never something that you hate. And that's, that can go along with the topic that you choose for this presentation. Uh, that's my project. Thank you. I'd like to thank my advisors, Ms. Carlton and Ms. Herndon, along with all of the mentors that I had and my community service partner, Paul Poirier. So thank you. Uh, probably at the chiropractic office because I've been to gyms before and I've learned and I've seen people train, but this is my first time seeing like a chiropractic office going on. Uh, when I was there also, she had a few patients in which she did the back cracking and I've never seen them before and that was pretty cool to see. Um, and yeah, just the lessons that she taught me, that's the most that I really learned. Um, don't be nervous to go. It seems like a great opportunity for you to get your health right. Um, specifically, Eileen, she's really big on the healthy side of things. Um, so if, if you're trying to get back into being healthy and stuff, I highly suggest going to Orange Chiropractic. Anything else? All right, thank you. Clip this on my belt, in my pants, or uh, pocket. Yeah, you can actually put it in your pocket if you want to. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and okay. Yep. I see what he meant by buggy. <laughs> What's that? It's a little, uh, some shit you gotta click it a few times to make yeah, it work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Got it. Hello, my name is Wyatt Mills, and my project is the effects of prominent sports on the, or sorry, yeah, prominent sports clubs on the community. Nope. There we go. So a little bit of background about myself. I've been playing soccer ever since I was four years old. I started in Orange County, where I played from four to eight, and then I moved to Culpeper, where I played travel for the first time from nine to twelve. And then I'm now currently in Charlottesville uh, playing for Scotland Elite. Uh, we are two-time State Cup champions, and we are from Maryland to Florida to play soccer games. This led me to what I wanted to promote the project. I figured I have so much time and so much dedication into something I really love. I might as well make the most of it. And this led into my internship with Jimmy Tharp. Jimmy Tharp is the technical director at Skyline Elite. He does a lot of the stuff behind the scenes that you don't see and affects a lot of the players and the coaches and everyone's daily life. For example, when I first went to Skyline Elite, I practiced from 5 to 6.30 every day. This meant that I got home from school, 
went straight to practice. Parents took me. I got home. I did all my homework, and I was able to do everything in a timely manner to get to bed. Now that I'm 18, and I don't need my parents to drive me everywhere, we have later practices. So now that I'm doing sports, I go from school to after-school sports, back home, do a little bit of homework, and then I go to another sport, and I'll get home to 10, 9, th uh, 10 to 30 at the earliest. So it just affects my daily life every day. Uh, another thing that I did with him that affects you, and you probably didn't notice it, is advertisements. He, um, I didn't get to directly interact with it, but, sorry, uh, I got to sit in on meetings about a uh, radio advertisement. I got changes in the text and the small changes in the wordings and the small changes in the tones and everything like that to make people uh, go to the website and join. And the coolest thing about this is I, you know, sit in in the meetings, and then a week later I got to ride in the car and I heard the radio, uh, heard the advertisement on the radio. Um, another thing that he does a lot of is sponsorships. Sponsorships are used to give uh, players financial aid that can't um, afford it. You can't. A lot of kids can't afford to go to North Carolina to Florida every other weekend, so they use sponsorships like the sign here to give you know, players financial aid so they can play on the teams they deserve to play on. Uh, the other thing he does is fundraising. On the picture to my left, you can see a $200,000 field house. This was raised two years ago and was finally finished built about a year ago. There was multiple ways we did this. We did fundraising events where we sold books that um, people had that they didn't use anymore. And one of the coolest things is we handed out flyers. And these flyers you could take to your local Chipotle. You would turn them in, it would cost you no extra money, but part of the revenue of uh, Chipotle would go to, you know, Skyline Elite and help build that uh, field house. Community service, I worked closely with Tim Schumann, who linked me up with the other coaches at OSA. I coached uh, kids from U5 and U6 to all the way up to U15, 16 girls. From the U5 and 6s, I learned that you have to make everything a game so they stay focused. If you're not doing, if you're making it a game, they're running around chasing butterflies. The next um, age I coached, uh, I coached was the U9 girls. Now, the U9 girls asked tons of questions. It didn't matter if you were talking about soccer, if you were talking about sports. They were asking questions about the U5 over there running after the butterfly. <laughs> so I had to make everything very intense so they were constantly focused on soccer and not having their mind wander other elsewhere. The next age I coached was the U13-14 boys for Tim Schumann. They asked nearly no questions, but they goofed off a lot, which is a big problem. <laughs> so it's another reason you have to keep the practice very intense, or else they're just sitting there talking to your friends, not getting anything out of it. And the last age group I coached was U15 girls for Tim Schumann as well. Now, this was my favorite group. They were very well behaved, and I got to teach a lot of the high-level soccer IQ. I got to teach the minute details of whether you should shift your hips in or out or should it uh, condense or expand your shape. And when I was doing all of this, I realized practice plans take a lot of time. And it's one of the biggest problems about coaching. It takes up a lot of time. If you're doing a job because coaching doesn't pay well, and you're also trying to travel there and back and spend an hour and a half or three hours if you're coaching multiple teams at a field, you don't want to always, you know, making practice plans for four or five or your two different teams and take an hour before every day to make it a, a plan. So this leads me into what my legacy is. So my legacy is making a catalog of soccer plans and soccer drills. So it uh, condenses the amount of time coaches need to make those practices. You don't, if you're, uh, if you're spending a lot of time at your job or you're spending a lot of time with your family, you don't have all of that time to you know, make 45 minutes worth of practice plans. This not only helps the coach, but also helps the player. The players are not getting rushed practice plans that are subpar. They're getting practice plans that have been curated through my uh, experience, through uh, high-level coaches that coach now nationally. Um, uh, what are I, uh, tips for the next generation? Take pictures. Pictures was the biggest thing I struggled with the entire time. I had to constantly be running and backtracking to try and get pictures that you know represented what I wanted to talk about. And the other thing was time management. Time management is a skill you cannot understate. 
It is something that I constantly need work on, as Mr. Pilot can tell you. <laughs> um, and it's something I really should have done on this project. You may have summer and fall to complete it, but it goes by so fast, especially with trying to do uh, scholarships and apply to schools. Uh, my future, I want to go to, I want to be an electrician. So I plan to go on a trade school uh, next year. I've applied to Virginia Technical Academy and I've applied to multiple other ones, but I've had yet to hear back. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of my uh, mentors, Tim Schumann, Jimmy Tharp, David Snyder, and I'd especially like to thank Ms. Herndon and Ms. Carlton for all the hard work they put in this and in dealing with my very bad procrastination. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, so it's supposed to be distributed in the spring season um, for OSA to all of the recreation and all of the travel coaches for whenever they needed it. Anything else? Good morning. My name is Haley Davis, and for my senior project, I focus around supporting teens in foster care. 150,000 teens in the United States alone are stigmatized for the simple fact that they are teenagers in the foster care system. Teens in foster care have been stereotyped to have bad behavior, but these bad behavior issues stem from the fact that they don't receive proper support. My childhood best friend was adopted herself, and over the years, I watched her family adopt three other teen boys, and they were temporary foster parents for numerous other children before, before they found their permanent home. Seeing the impact that they made on so many different young kids made me develop a passion for helping others. I completed my internship during the months of June and July at the Mass. Valerie Ward was my mentor for my internship as a master's in social work and has been working for five years. It's the current director of the foster care system works and she also connected me with my second mentor Madison Hutter. Madison has been a social worker for three years, and she took me on various trips with her to visit foster children. The first trip we went on was a boy named Zeke, who was four years old. He had been with his foster mother since he was three months old, 
because he was born addicted to drugs, so his mother's rights were terminated. The father was in the current process of trying to regain custody to Zeke, so we had to have a difficult conversation with his foster mother, who he had been with for so long. We also brought him some clothes that the agency had bought for him, and he was so excited to look through all of his new clothes and shoes. I also went on a trial, which is when custody is taken away from a parent, and after they fix a few things, it is temporarily restored, and there is a trial period, so social worker has to come out and check up on them twice a month to make sure everything is going smoothly. This particular case was that of five sisters who had recently been restored back to their father's custody. I was also able to sit on a meeting, sit in on a meeting along with a few other officials concerning a troubled child in a residential facility and her progress she had made since then being admitted. Another meeting I was able to sit on in on was one with eight other social workers and the department's lawyer and I got to hear about all the difficult cases they had with their teen fosters and the legal aspects of those cases. During my internship I learned that it is especially hard for teens specifically in foster care to find homes. This is due to the stigma I mentioned earlier. In total in Madison County only five foster families and the department's caseload includes 30 children. So what this means for teens is that many of them are sent to other counties, sometimes multiple hours away, and they have to start completely fresh with people they've never met before. Because of this stress, I realized that I wouldn't even know what to do in this situation, so I wanted to focus my project around specifically teens in foster care. Emily Taylor was my community service mentor and also the person whom I did my expert interview with. We discussed the different ways to support teens and what she thought were the best ways. And she also told me that when emergency removals happen, the kids are not able to take many of their own belongings with them. And the ones that they do often are placed in trash bags to be hauled around. This is very degrading in such a stressful time. She told me that the department had bags for young children with things such as stuffed animals and coloring books, but they had absolutely nothing like this for teenagers. So for my community service project, I decided to hold a drive in which I collected bags and items that could go in them to teens to have, for teens to have when they come into the system. So they, they have their own items to carry with them wherever they go. I was able to raise over $500 in which I went out to different stores and bought items with, as well as received numerous donations from community members. Some of the items I collected included men's and women's clothing, pajamas, socks, underwear, toiletry, and hygiene items. I was also able to purchase some comfort items such as reusable water bottles, journals, art supplies, as well as five blankets. In total, I collected 13 bags. And this, my community service project will have a lasting impact on at least 13 teens that come into the Madison Department of Social Services. I also partnered with my school's DECA club because I thought it would be a great way to maximize my donations for my project. DECA stands for Distributive Education Club of America and each year they have to participate in a community service project in which they have 75% membership participation. As you can see on the screen, this was in fact a maximize my donations because all of the items up there were ones that DECA members donated. For my research paper, I studied the best ways to support teens in foster care. The three best ways that I found were to provide foster teens with a sense of normalcy, social support, and financial support. When teens come into foster care, nothing is normal about their lives. They are be t being taken away from everything they know and be putting in, are put into the homes of people that they've never met before. So it is very important to make them feel as normal as possible. Normalcy 
includes letting them stay with a friend for a weekend or letting them join the school soccer team or join just anything that a normal teenager would do. Social support is very important to the development of teenagers and foster teens lack that mostly. Social support can be broken down into three categories, emotional, instrumental, and informational. Um, giving emotional support to a foster teen would be being that person that they can come to about any hard times they're having or any emotions they're feeling or just being a shoulder for them to cry on. Instrumental support includes meeting their basic needs such as driving them to school or making them soup when they're sick or maybe tidying up their room after they've had a long, hard, busy week. Informational support is being that person that guides them, that can teach them the things that their parents would typically teach them if they lived with them. During my research, I discovered that 49% of teens in foster care become addicted to drugs or in jail at least once in their life. By educating foster parents, I believe that we can drastically reduce this percentage. My future plans include attending Old Dominion University online to re receive my bachelor's of psychology and eventually my master's. I hope to become a child psychologist so that I can help troubled teens in a different way than that of social workers. The biggest piece of advice I would give to upcoming seniors would be to start now. I started thinking about what I wanted to do for my project late in my junior year and by the beginning of the summer I had already had my internship planned out. This made my fall semester so much easier because I didn't have to struggle to find a place that I could go to that would fit my hours because most of the time as we're getting out of school at 2.30, most businesses are closing by 4.30 or 5, so it makes it very hard to get all your hours together. I would also say to take as many pictures as you can. During my internship, I didn't take a single picture, so I had to go back and take them all. I was too scared to be like, hey, can you take a selfie with me during my internship because everyone was so professional. And I also, because of confidentiality reasons, I couldn't take pictures on my trips to see the foster kids. And the last piece of advice I would give upcoming seniors is to never forget that your advisors are there to help you in any way that you need. If you have any questions, they will answer them and they won't just let you sit there and struggle. The biggest thing that I learned about myself during this project is that I can make a bigger difference in people's lives than I had ever thought. All it takes is a little bit of your time and making a need aware to your community to make such a big difference in multiple people's lives. This concludes my presentation and thank you all for listening. Are there any questions at this time? So during my internship, I had previously thought that I was going to go to school for social work, but my internship kind of changed my mind on that. They, I liked the idea that they don't sit in the office all day and that they go on these monthly visits of these foster children and that they get to go to court, but it's also a lot of paperwork and a lot of rules and regulations you have to follow. Like some, my mentor Madison was telling me how sometimes that she knows a situation isn't safe for a child, but if she has no proof, there's absolutely nothing she could do about that. And I don't know if I could handle feeling so powerless like that. It's also a very stressful job, and you're on call 24-7. For example, with the child that I was talking about that went to the residential facility, they couldn't find a residential facility to take her for two weeks. So Madison had to stay in the office with her on, and sleep on a mattress on the floor with her for two weeks and never got to go home. And I don't think I can do that. I need a more nine to five job. Are there any other questions? Yes. 
The other option for my community service project was actually to assist a social worker with coming up with marketing and educational materials to educate more people on about the need for foster families and what it entails. So I know with the Madison County Department of Social Services, they're actually trying to educate some more people to get some more foster families because there is only five in the entire county of 13,000 people. Any other questions? <laughs> Thanks. All right. Since this is such a big and back. Hi, my name is James Bryington, and today I'm going to be presenting about the most effective ways to remove dams while maintaining a healthy ecosystem. So this graph right here is all the dams that have been removed in America from 1912 to present day. And it may look like a lot, but it is over more than a century of dam removal. So I believe that this number is going to increase exponentially over the next few decades due to the increase in technology and the increase in people's awareness about the environment and their willingness to want to protect it. Um, I chose this topic because I really enjoy the outdoors. I love everything about the outdoors, fishing, hunting, hiking, everything about it. And I want to be able to protect it for future generations so they can enjoy the same things that I have enjoyed. So you're probably wondering why we need to remove dams. I mean, what's the point? So one of the main reasons that dams are harmful to the environment is the organisms in water, such as fish, eels, mussels, all things like that. So I mean, as you can see by this picture, it is a larger than normal dam, but there's no way a fish is going to <laughs> scale that, or an eel, or anything's going to get over that. So one of the main issues is that speciation can occur between the populations below the dam and above the dam. And what that means is that over time, and I mean like decades, the fish at the upstream of the dam will evolve differently than the fish downstream of the dam. And eventually this can create two completely different species, which can cause problems for both sides of the dam and the overall ecosystem. It can also affect the banks and the plants on the sides of the rivers and things like that. Now, tearing down a dam is not that easy. We can't just go around and take them all out. Some of them, such as Lake Anna, have, are used for nuclear power cooling. Some are for reservoirs that provide water to cities and towns. And there are also effects to removing dams. Um, the sediment displacement when you remove a dam can be detrimental to an environment. Um, not really the sand is what we think of when we think of sediment, just the sand on the surface, but underneath that there are coarse sediments that are bigger rocks and bigger chunks of stuff that 
if they get washed down, can cause huge fish kills. They can cause muscle suffocations and can deplete entire populations in these ecosystems. So in my studies, I focused on two different types of dam removal. On your left here, we have the staged removal method, which you bring in heavy equipment, as you can see in the picture, and take out pieces of the dam little by little until you have the entire thing deconstructed. And this, it provides for a slower transfer of water from above the dam to below the dam and allows the fish at the bottom and the top of the dam to better uh, acclimate to their new environments. On your right here, we have the explosive method, which is just what it sounds like. They drill holes in the dams, put explosives in it, and set it off, and the dam is gone. And then you have to clean up the mess. Uh, this typically sends, I mean, just a rush of tons of water downriver, taking all the sediment, all the coarse sediment with it, and can cause many problems. So throughout my research, I deduced that the staged removal method is the better method in most case scenarios for obvious reasons. Um, I mean, it's much less sediment transfer, much less um, water coming through at once. I mean, an influx of fresh water can kill entire populations of fish. And it's just, it's a much more gradual transfer. While the explosive method is just all at once, it's just all the water comes through, all the sediment and everything comes through. The only bad thing about the stage removal method is that it takes longer, it's more difficult to perform, it's more expensive, and it can actually be more dangerous because you have to have people out there on the excavators removing the materials. So for my internship for this project, I interned at the Rapidan Mill Dam, which is on the Rapidan River, which is just down the road from here. And so they're actually planning on removing this dam. Their original plan was to start with the deconstruction this fall of 2022. I'm not sure if they're going to hit that, but that's their plan. So I interned here for two days with a group of uh, scientists and engineers and I for a total of 12 hours. On the first day, me and a group of three other people went upstream of the dam in kayaks and then floated back down and we basically surveyed the banks and the water depths and turbidity levels of upstream of the dam to see how removing the dam would affect just upstream and not just downstream of the dam. And then on the second day, I was able to sit in on a meeting between the people I was with on the first day, which was the engineers and the scientists, and the representatives from different organizations, such as um, there was one person from Virginia Tech another from DWR. So I got to witness the coalition between the two and how they settled debates and brought up different points and things such as that. And it was a very good overall experience. So my mentor for really the whole project was Jeff Wall. He's the director of the Rapidan Institute for Central Center of Natural Capital. And so basically he controls for that organization, everything to do with the Rapidan River. So that includes things such as the dam removal, um, pollution, different things such as that. And he was with me all the way throughout my internship. He also provided me with my expert interview for the project. And he was just always there if I needed someone to ask questions or just if I had something that I needed to know, he pretty much always knew what I needed to know. For the community service aspect of my project, me and my father went out multiple days and picked up trash along the Rapidan River, along the banks. It was October, so we didn't go into the water and pick up trash from the river. But we were able to pick up trash along the banks, and it truly surprised me how much litter there was. I figured we'd go out and pick up a few cans, maybe a bottle here or there. But, I mean, as you can see, that's from one small section of the river, and there was a lot more trash than I figured would be there. So for the second part of my, inter of my community service, sorry, I made a presentation about littering and I presented it to Ms. Estes's class. So the presentation is basically about the effects of littering, uh, why people litter, how we can stop people from litter, and things such as that. And this also ties into my legacy 
or Ms. Estes has access to the document and it is my hope that she will continue to share it with her future classes to teach future generations about littering and the effects of it. So I learned a lot about myself and what I'd like to do in the future during this project. Um, it really sp spiked my interest in the world around me and how I can help nature and humans at the same time. And it was just a very good experience overall. I don't know if I would change anything about my internship or my community service. I feel like it all went very well and I learned a lot and enjoyed myself during it. Advice that I would give other people that are just coming in, you know, juniors or even freshmen that are thinking ahead, would be to not procrastinate, number one. That, that got me a few times. Um, and then number two would be to think ahead, which ties in with the not procrastinating, and don't get discouraged. Um, I mean, start looking for your internship right after junior year during the summer, and don't get discouraged if you get declined a few times, because being 16 or 17, an internship is not an easy thing to obtain. So just don't get discouraged and keep trying. So for my future plans, plan to attend college and major in biology. I'm not 100% certain which college I'm going to attend, but this uh, project has really speak, spiked my interest in biology, and I'd like to be able to do similar things that I did during my internship with my future career. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and your being here. I'd like to thank Ms. Estes, Mr. Walden, Ms. Carlton, Ms. Herndon, Mr. Caraway. I'd like to thank everybody that helped me along the way, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Questions? I would assume so. I would assume most of them are smaller scale dams, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I haven't researched it at all. I could make a few assumptions um, based on like like the like are you talking like sea level rising well, stuff I, I like that? I remember a family member who lives on, on the west coast in Nevada and California. Mm -hmm. They're greatly affected by uh, water erosion yes. from the Flood Reservoir. It's a reason why you can't take out a lot of dams is because they provide water for like Las Vegas and things like that. So the, the fish populations being separated is a big part. Um, and another big part that I, I didn't mention in the project was that a lot of fish migrate, such as um, striper populations. And this is a problem with the Rapidan Dam, actually. Is, so their beds where they lay their eggs are past the dam. And when they build the dam, they can't get there. So they just they swim upstream, they hit the dam, and there's, there's nowhere for them to go. So they have either have to create new beds for spawning or their population ceases to exist. Are you in yes. Okay. So with the explosive demolition, yes, it can. Um, with the stage demolition, it's much more controlled. When they pick up a piece of the dam, they usually you know, put it in a dumpster or move it to somewhere else so it can be reused. Um, but with the explosive demolition, yes, it can affect them.
Okay. Ready to go. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom, if you're watching this. Move the curl away. Can I use a laser pointer? Can I use a laser pointer if I want to? Like uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Don't point it at anybody else. No, no, I won't. Hi guys, I'm Jackson Wayne, and my topic is the art of peer pressure. Uh, so why I did this project, I, the kid with stitches fibrosis, I'm normally a kid that's not really taken lightly or normally. Like, I'm not really seen as a normal kid. I'm also short, that's kind of a bad thing. But uh, so basically what uh, stitches fibrosis is, if you guys don't know what it is, it deals with your pancreas and your lungs. And as a kid, I was always told, you know, smoking is a bad thing. My mom was very cautious about what like people were doing around me. Like she, if someone was smoking and uh, come to our house, she would always have them smoke on the back porch. Never in the house, because she always wanted to keep me safe. And she, she's good for that, I love her for that. And so why I did this project was because I have been bullied also by saying no for people uh, peer pressure and be like, oh, are you sure you don't want this? I'm like, no, I, I'm good. Trust me, I'm good. And I realized what it, ha what it can do to my body if I do it and I start getting addicted and it's just, it's just not, it's not gonna go well. So what I did was, uh, with this project, um, my research project, my topic, was what are ways that kids can stop uh, being affected by vape or be peer pressured into vape? And I came up with two reasons, which is both kind of similar, is just talking to people by uh, basically talking to the parents and talking to them, because a lot, a lot of people know how bad peer pressure really is, if once you really think about it and start looking into it and Peer pressure, actually, show of hands, how many people have been peer pressured into doing something that they regret right now? Okay. My point is exactly. So a lot of people have been peer pressured into something they really regret doing. And so basically in my internship, I am with, with uh, Sergeant David McMaster, who is the school resource officer. Um, basically what I did was I wrote notes, I wrote about what he did, wrote about the laws that were, everything was doing, like, for teenagers, like you get like misdemeanors if you're caught with a vape, and how serious it is depending on how serious you take school for each uh, punishment is if you're taking vape. So like your first offense, you wouldn't really get uh, to, if, you, if your grades are good and you get caught with the vape, they might give you a warning, but if your grades are bad, you'll get suspended. I guess it's like the rule changes now. And for, so after that, I went to the security, uh, the um, sheriff's office and the Orange County, the new one, uh, that's uh, my other mentor. His name is Chris Votau. He's the investigator. And as you can see, this whole entire car, well, this is the investigator. It's like the undercover cop's car. There's a difference between an undercover and a patrol car. The main thing being the weapon of uh, choice. This one is basically just a barrel with no foregrip, with a small mag, no optic. But with the other patrol car, it has a suppressor, optic, longer barrel, more mags, so that when they come out and they go on duty, it's more, they're more prepared, as, as I, I probably should say. What was significant about this was the art of peer pressure for my community service. Again, um, I forgot about this um, because I don't know. So I was in the hospital uh, in December for um, a whole bunch of crazy stuff, I, I should say. And it really cut back on the time that I had to do this uh, presentation. So Ms. Carlton told me that all I needed to do Let's do this thing. Do another presentation and send it to the Orange County Office on Youth with uh, Ashley Jacobs. And I talked to her about it. And she was asking me um, when I wanted to meet up. And I told her I was going to meet up to her on, X, on this day. But that was unfortunately the day I was in the hospital. And everything just got cut short. 
And uh, so I just basically did this presentation. This is one of the slides that was in it, which it talked about everything that, uh, all the drug abuse that is in, um, basically, in Orange County. So this whole entire project really isn't about uh, just vaping. It's also about peer pressure, because a lot of things, like, you could be uh, introduced to something. You, can, you don't know, a lot of people don't really introduce it by themselves. Someone had to have uh, gave it to them, like, hey, you should try this, or you should try that. That's how it's been going around, and that's why there is 35% uh, of teens are vaping right now in high school. Um, what was significant about this entire uh, slideshow is the fact that she can actually, can, uh, Ms. Ms. Jacobs can use the presentation and that she could t help talk to people, like back with um, Ms. McMaster said, that uh, we can uh, talk about them because talking to them instead of punishing is the biggest thing uh, that I personally believe that you should do because you can't punish them. If you punish them, then you're going to keep on doing it because they just know that you're going to get punished. Uh, so what I learned about, what did I learn about myself was I was persistent. I was determined to get this done because of how much this project really meant to me as a person. How I don't want to see kids just start vaping and then they're ruining their lives before it even starts. I mean, we're not in college yet. We haven't even gotten a chance to explore what life is really about. I mean, I haven't either, but I'm just saying that I'm, I'm more prepared. I feel like I am more prepared than a person who would just want to vape all the time. So what would I have done differently? The obvious answer is not gone to the hospital, but unfortunately, <laughs> you're kind of faced with uh, challenges every day that you have to overcome. But what would I could have done differently, which is also something that I'm going to tell the uh, younger audience to uh, think, don't procrastinate, please. I had a person who procrastinates a lot, too much actually. Uh, just don't procrastinate. Get a lot of pictures, as people had previously said, uh, because you're going to want to document this. Unfortunately, I didn't get a lot of pictures. I would see the, uh, I guess I would, my dad would say living in the moment, kind of just trying to look at everything because the new sheriff's office, I was too busy just grafting in the awe of how big the actual office is compared to the old office. And um, it just, just do every, like it's hard to really do everything when you're procrastinating because uh, not I'm not gonna lie uh, the last week of the internship was when I got my internship done so it was kind of it was bad on my part but in the community service uh, I feel like the hospital really kind of saved me because I was gonna be in big trouble if I didn't get my community service done but my future plans I will be attending Liberty University in the fall I'm going to be getting a degree in Homeland Security and hopefully uh, improving my relationship with the big man above, uh, to God. Uh, my acknowledgments, uh, thank you Captain Smith and Chris Botal and Detective Brian Steele for letting me tour the Sheriff's Office, uh, Ashley Jacobs and the Orange County Youth Leader for wanting to use my presentation and BRVGS, Ms. Carlton and Ms. Herndon for getting on my butt about uh, getting my work done fast, uh, which I still probably didn't do. but. And that's my favorite Bible verse right there. Uh, that's, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> you guys have any questions? Because, so, as a, as a kid, uh, so, my mom, like, for punishment, like, my mom would tell me not to do things, and I would still do it, and when she would talk to me about why I shouldn't do something, it kind of put in more perspective about what it really could do if I, like, did something, and uh, that's what made me not want to do it. So, I feel like if you, you can't really punish them, because they don't really know what they're, gonna be, they're being punished on. It's more of about, like, they've got to know why they're being punished. That's just how I would see it, because... You know, you gotta l have people learn what they're getting punished on so that they won't do it earlier or long later on in life. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay.
that or? Yep, if you got that, looks good, then that can go right in your pocket, actually. Oh, I got my wallet in that yeah, pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Alright. Yeah, a little bit on the side. Yeah. Good. A little bit more. Alright, I'll reach in. Looks good. Not quite straight. There we go. I don't want to choke you, but there you go. Just a little more formal there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm feeling good. Hi. Oh. Get introduced to one. I'm waiting for Miss Dalton to come in. Sorry. Yeah, I'm struggling with it. All right. Our next presenter, Jake Segura, is going to talk to us about optometry. All right. So, hi. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jacob Kazora, and this is my senior project, Insight into Optometry. Great start. All right, so the concept that my project was focused on was technology and medicine. Like how does it impact it? How does it influence it? So I have an interest in medicine as a possible career. So I like helping people and that's what the medical field's all about. Additionally, I'm also skilled with technology. I'm good with programming and things like that. So I can get my project at the end. So my research question was focused around how does technology impact the medical field and what are the long-term effects of these impacts over time? So there are several pros and cons to te technology in the medical field. By far the pros outweigh the cons. The pros include things such as increased efficiency as well as pr productivity. It also like improves their overall rates in the practice as well. As for the disadvantages, more technology means a greater increase for cybersecurity attacks and um, it diminishes the value of skilled laborers. However, these could be regulated through things like regulations and um, security. So I conducted my internship at Route 2020 Vision Center in Locust Grove, VA. I started in September to January. So I had two mentors for my internship, Dr. Clawford, who's featured on the left, and Mr. Clawford, who's featured in the middle. So my research with Dr. Clawford was more focused upon the qualitative aspects of um, technology in medicine. She showed me how she uses her computer to like diagnose her patients. Like it can do things like read the prescription from their eye, um, detect illnesses or irregularities such as cataracts and things like that. And it can also tell her what medication she needs to prescribe for patients. So with Mr. Clawford, my research is more focused upon the quantitative aspect. I used all the machinery in his shop to make eyeglasses. And I based my research upon how many eyeglasses I can make within an hour. By the end of the internship, I was able to make five pairs of eyeglasses within an hour. And over the course of the entire internship, I made over 30. Man, every time. All right, there we go. So some of the machinery that Mr. Clawford showed me how to use. On the left is a device used to trace the eyeglass sh lens shape. Basically, you take the lenses out of the frame, you plug it in the machine, and it traces them, and creates a digital rendering of the lens shape. Additionally, with the new lens, they come in like a round circular shape. You can see it right there. This device attaches a holder onto it, so it can be inserted into the machine on the right, which cuts the lenses. Basically, it shapes them from the digital rendering. However, sometimes they come out too big, so you have to reinsert them and then shave them down until they fit. Okay. All right. So this device reads the prescription of eyeglass lenses. It's really useful because it allows you to quickly scan a patient's prescription from their eyeglasses. Additionally, when um, new lenses arrive at the eyeglass facility, the vision center, I mean, um, they're not marked, so you have to use which is which. 
Additionally, you also have to line up the axis of the lens because they're incorrectly marked. It'll make the eyeglasses useless and won't do anything for the user. So this device is used, well, it has two functions. This main part, which is right there, shaves down the eyeglass lenses because sometimes with certain frames, the edges come out too sharp and it can cut the person's face if they fall or something. So basically this smooths them down like a sander. And then on the right, right there, is an eyeglass heater. So basically what it does, certain frames don't have screws, so you can't really loosen them to put the lenses in. So you have to heat them in order for you to pop them in. If you don't do that, you can break the frame or crack the lens as well. So this device is an eyeglass drill. It's very complicated to use. Basically, it's for the frameless glasses. The bridge and the side parts are attached directly onto the lens. So you have to drill a hole into the lens itself in order to attach them. It's very hard because if you're slightly off, it can ruin the entire pair of glasses and you'd have to start again. So for my community service, it was centered around a fundraiser to collect eyeglasses. So I constructed a donation box for, our, for the fundraiser out of plywood. It took me over 15 hours to make. I had to restart several times. Apparently, nail guns and plywood, or ply boards do not, do not mix. Yeah, lots of splinters. So once I constructed the donation box, here's the final. I painted it school colors of your spirit for fundraiser. Yeah, so um, I put it in the nurse's office to collect eyeglasses. So for the, also for the legacy of the project, I hope to keep the eyeglass box there to constantly collect eyeglasses. The fundraiser itself, I started in December, and it took the month of February. Overall, we collected a pairs of eyeglasses, which, yeah, hang on, give me a second, which I took to the Lions Club at Lake of the Woods. Basically, I sanitized all the glasses and I delivered them to the Lions Center so they can give them to locally so that, so they will stay local and be given to those who need eyeglasses. It's significant in how because without eyeglasses, they won't be able to see. So I figured this would help a lot of people. So for my future plans, I'd like to go to UVA and study either medicine or engineering. I'm still undecided, but I'm still trying to figure it out. Yeah. So some advice I would give someone doing this project, start as early as possible. I ran into a lot of problems during the summer trying to get an internship. I was rejected by a ton of places, but I finally locked down one. Yeah. So the sooner you start, the better, because it'll allow you to deal with the issues you face sooner. You won't mess with your deadline need to get extensions and things like that. All right, thank you for the presentation. This has been an Inside Into Tom. Sorry. <laughs> Any questions? No? Did you advertise that Yeah, it was difficult, but yeah, it was somehow got out. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> Haley? Uh, no, typically they take the lenses out and put new ones in for the patient. Yeah, sometimes the Lions Club do, does it for free with them when they can't afford the eyeglasses. Yeah, the frames are the expensive part. They're like 200 to $500 each. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes? Thank you. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a tough decision for me because. Right. So what kind of advice would you give to someone following that? I guess, like, I guess just go with your gut. Like, do what you like doing. 
for me, I'm, it's a really tough decision for me because I like helping people, but I also like technology and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Everybody points at the screen. It's like there's no receiver on the <laughs> screen, right? It's, it's, it's actually at the computer. My name is Bailey Dingus, and today I'm proud to present to you my senior project on adoption and fostering in no-kill animal shelters. I chose this project not only because I've always had a passion for animals and I want to go into veterinary medicine, but also because since the COVID pandemic, I have noticed some of the hardships that animal shelters, no-kill animal shelters in particular, have been facing as a result of an increased animal intake and a decrease in the number of people willing to adopt. So before I started, I wanted to go over the difference between no-kill and kill shelters. So kill shelters are able to euthanize animals for any reason, whether that be they need more room in the shelter or an animal is sick and they don't want to deal with it, whereas no-kill shelters are legally required to keep at least 90% of their animals alive, and if those animals leave the shelter, it has to be through adoption. Um, no-kill animal shelters also, if they are able to euthanize, it has to be because of a extreme medical condition or extreme behavioral condition, whether that be an animal has a brain tumor or a terminal illness they cannot recover from, or an animal is seen to be unfit around other dogs or cats or other people. So my research was focused on the best methods for no-kill animal shelters to promote adoption and fostering. So the first method I found was social media. Social media is a very big part of our lives today, especially during our technological era, and when no-kill animal shelters use it viably, it can increase the amount of adoptions by 66% and the amount of fosters by 45%. It also allows animal shelters to showcase animals that are not typically desirable for adoption, whether that be long stay animals that they have seen have not gone adopted, animals with health conditions, animals with anxiety or other medical conditions. So my other, my second method was adoption events. Adoption events can take place many different ways, but it's basically where the animal shelter will decrease the price in order to bring in a lot of people in order to adopt and they will basically promote adoption. And this also allows the animal shelter to get rid of a lot of animals at one time so they're, in, so they're able to bring in more, especially with no-kill shelters where they are not able to euthanize their animals and they have a certain animal intake where sometimes they have to turn down taking in animals because they don't have enough capacity in their shelter. My last method was websites. So websites are where a lot of people first go when they are looking into a business and that's no different with animal shelters. When animal shelters lay out their website correctly, they will have um, their information, they will have adoption and fostering forms, volunteer forms, and a lot of animal shelters list their animals with their pictures on 
their websites in order for people to see. This allows people to see the animals and get attached to them before coming into the shelter and meeting them, which allows more people to come into the shelter and adopt. My internship took place at the Charlottesville Albemarle SPCA on October 20th of 2021, where I shadowed the fostering department of the shelter. And my mentor was Taylor Lefebvre, uh, who is the director of operations at the shelter. So I wanted to share a couple experiences that I had during my internship. One was with the dog on the left, white one. Her name was Valerie, and she actually got adopted a month before I came in to do my internship, but her owners who adopted her had to bring her back because of reasons due to the pandemic and they can no longer take care of her. So because of this, the people at the shelter, the workers, had a very strong emotional bond with Valerie and they wanted to give her the best home possible. So several days before I did my internship, this couple came in and they looked at Valerie and they decided that they wanted to adopt her. And so when I came in, they brought their dog Toledo in order for the Toledo to meet Valerie and make sure that they were okay being together and that they were able to live together. And so it actually went really well and Valerie ended up getting adopted. And so the second experience I wanted to share was with the dog on the right. Her name was Dusty Road. She was actually a stray that got brought in and the man named her that because he found her on the side of a road. And then, so they scanned her for a microchip because they didn't believe that she was an actual stray. They believed that she was actually missing. So they found out that she had not been in their shelter before. So they took her back for a vet visit to make sure that they, she didn't have any worms or anything. And then they went on to look for her owners. So at my internship, I noticed that the animal shelter was lacking a bunch of needed supplies, whether that be beds or crates or food or treats and toys for their animals. So I decided to partner with the Orange County High School SBA and Ms. Jamerson in order to have a supply drive where I could collect supplies for the CA SPCA and donate it to them in order to help them during a difficult time like this. So behind me is the flyer that I posted onto the SBA Instagram and that I put up around the school in order for people to get notified about my, sh my drive and donate. So behind me are all the supplies that I collected. We did have a lot of food, but we also had litter and puppy pads and treats and toys and leashes for the dogs. And overall, I collected around $200 worth of donations. So I learned during my time at the CASBCA that it's very hard to run an animal shelter, especially during times like these where not a lot of people are mentally or financially capable of adopting a dog or a cat. And it's very hard when you get attached to these animals and the longer they're in there, the more stressed out they become. So you kind of see them lose their personality a little bit. And so for future governor school students, I would recommend doing your internship over the summer to relieve stress during your fall semester but also pick something you are passionate about because I would not have liked my presentation as much if I chose something that I did not want to do. And I believe it would show in your website, in your presentations, and in your expo. So in the fall, I will be attending Roanoke College and studying biology and pre-veterinary medicine and afterwards, hopefully, attending vet school to become a certified DVM. And I would like to give a shout out to Mr. B, a future BRVGS AP bio teacher, for encouraging me to chase my dreams and for allowing me to realize that I wanted to go into bio, which pushed me to veterinary medicine, which pushed me to doing my internship with the CASBCA. I also wanted to give a big thank you to Taylor Lefebvre and Ms. Lori Jamerson for mentoring me and helping me through all my project, and also Ms. Carlton and Ms. Herndon for being my number one supporters and helping me through everything. I'm not sure. <laughs> Kaya. It depends on the event. Recently they had one where the dogs were only 25, but I know that they had one a little bit ago where cats were only 20. So I think it just depends on the event. And then sometimes the events are like one day and then sometimes they're over the course of several days. So it all just depends on what the shelter decides to do.
Yeah, I think they, I think they're seeing like an influx of animals. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why no-kill shelters have been turning away animals is because people aren't able to take care of them and are bringing dogs in. And it's very like hard for the animals to go from being in a home to being in a shelter. So they try to get them out as fast as possible. But in order to do that, they have to promote the adoptions. Kaya. <laughs>
was very cautious. Okay, now you're on. Okay. Well, I'll bring it back to you when I finish. Okay. So am I good to start? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here you go, sweets. <laughs> You're welcome. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Mr. Caraway's here. Mr. Caraway's here with the food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. L he can take his time. everyone, my senior project was how COVID-19 affected mental health. So I am Renaya Bright and I'm currently a senior here at Orange County High School. I participate in a few clubs throughout the high school which include NHS, the Feminist Club, and also the youth. So um, I'm also very interested in activism, advocating for human rights, especially regarding mental health and also the justice system. So my overall topic was to evaluate how COVID-19 affected mental health, particularly in children of all ages. I was able to complete my project with the help of Mr. Larry Kilby, Ms. Carlton, and Ms. Herndon. And I chose this top topic because I personally struggled with mental health during the pandemic that took place in 2020. So to answer the question, how did COVID-19 affect mental health? I knew that I had to reach out to a professional about the issue. Once I did, I realized that I was not alone with regards to my mental health during the pandemic that took place in, or two years, two years ago. So for my internship, Larry Kilby was the perfect choice for a mentor because of how knowledgeable he is about mental health with regards to children. A few, a few of you may know Larry Kilby because he was a former track coach here and everybody loves Mr. Kilby, so. So Mr. Um, Mr. Kilby owns a company called My Vision. My Vision is his own company that he runs, and it is a mixture between his track team and also a mentorship program for children of all ages. Okay. So for my internship, I was able to go to his track practices to mentor and shadow the children that he was um, coaching. During this time, I interviewed a few of the children and asked them questions such as, how did COVID-19 affect your life or how did it affect your, um, your sports? So a lot of them answered that they were not able to compete because of the pandemic and it really restricted a lot of the you know, events that they had to run in or anything like that. For my community service, I did two different activities. The first one was a flyer that I created on Canva. So the flyer just included different tips and tricks of how to improve your mental health. Um, examples of this were to take a break from social media, to make sure that you're sleeping more, to socialize with those who keep you positive, to eat healthier, and to engage in physical activity. After getting permission from my administration and also my principal, I went around with my friend of mine, Haley Davis, and hung up a few of the flyers around the school. So the second part of my community service was to create a podcast. August of last semester, a group of friends and I decided to create a podcast just to talk about anything under the sun, basically. So I came to them with an idea of how to use the podcast to promote how important mental health is by having a guest speaker there, which was Nadia, and Nadia just her own experiences with mental health and how she was able to overcome some of them. Um, the rest of us in the episode were also able to express our own concerns about mental health and give each other, each other like tips and tricks on how to improve it. Shout out to the librarians for, <laughs> 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 for
for, you know, dealing with our podcast group every day. So for research, I basically just researched, like, how did COVID-19 specifically affect children and also how to evolve from that. So I looked up different ways I, and used um, Mr. Kilby's tips and tricks on how to observe and how to re respond to those kids. I was able to come up with three main topics, which were to um, build self-esteem, create a better home life, and also how to find easier access to treatment. Um, a lot of parents and kids do not know where to find treatment for these things, so it often results in them making bad habits, you know, like whether that's vaping, drinking, anything like that. So for my le legacy was to continue to leave a positive impact on the community. My goal is for children of all ages to reach out and get treatment that is needed, because like I said before, they often result in bad habits. Most children do not know how to find the correct treatment, which is why my research paper included different types of organizations to go to, and, di and also talking to your peers and your family, like your parents. So by hearing teenagers talk about how much we struggle personally with mental health, especially on the podcast, I was hoping that other teenagers would feel more open to go ask for help and get the help that they need. advice for upcoming Blue Ridge seniors. So I know everyone has said that procrastination is a big one and we are not lying. <laughs> <laughs> procrastination is huge. Um, Blue Ridge offers you to start in the summer or the fall. It is like, you know, you should start in the summer. I started in the fall, which was a mistake because I figured that, oh, I had the whole fall to do this. Like, I'll be fine. I was not fine. And <laughs> that's why, like Haley had mentioned, you need to start, like, and so did um, a few others. You need to start thinking about this after your junior year because procrastination, it just it takes over everything. Um, starting in the summer of allows you to find your internship a lot faster and your mentor a lot faster and be able to understand what your, go like what your question is and start thinking about things like this presentation or the expo that's coming up. Also, asking your advisors for help is a big deal. Um, Knowing that Ms. Carlton and Ms. Herndon were there the entire time for me helped 100%. Like, I would go to them and ask questions, like simple questions, like when's the deadline, deadline for this, when's the deadline for that, and they were just able to help me tremendously. So my future plans, um, you know, the school year is coming to an end and we are mostly all seniors, so I recently committed to James Madison University where I will be majoring in psychology. Because my passion is so strong for advocating for mental health and anything like that, um, after college, I plan to become a forensic psychologist. Thank you all. During like the practices, he would tell me like, oh, pay more attention to this kid. And if the kid was struggling with something school related because of his mental health, like not being able to get good grades and stuff like that, he would tell me to notice like the way he was, mostly actions, also how he spoke to people, like to find out if he was aggravated, um, irritated, anything like that. So just looking at like body language and words and just overall how they react was like a big thing for that. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> yes, Lazar. So, yes, yeah, so I was just planning on doing COVID-19 and mental health for everyone, but I decided to do children because I feel like we are becoming adults very soon and, like, we're going to be very important to the world like a year so <laughs> I but I did think about that um, actually the paper that I wrote was more towards parents helping their kids so so it was like you know how to create a better home life for your kids or how to build your kids self-esteem stuff like that Did I answer your question okay <laughs> I was 
shaking the whole time. Oh, oh, here, take, take the mic. <laughs> Sorry. Well, how do I put this on? You want to clip it? Is it like yeah, you just clip it. Yeah. And then. Oh, there you go. Resilience to help with this, and it doesn't have to be an 
activity. You can read a book, do it, write a journal, anything will help. From here, I did my um, internship at Lake of the Woods Fire and Rescue, and my mentor was Jack Kelly. He was the assistant chief there, and he has worked there for over 30 years. Um, Mr. Kelly is actually 74 years old, and he assisted me the entire way through this project and was so happy to be able to help me. Um, me and Mr. Kelly met on December 13th at 6 a.m. so I could work a shift with him on the ambulance. During this, I actually experienced um, an emergency call. And I can't tell much about it because I have to keep it very confidential, but it's real. Burnout is real. The amount of stress and how fast paced it is, I promise you, it's real. And it's very hard because once you leave the patient at the hospital, you don't know what happens from there. You leave them and you go. There is no time to think about the possibilities of if they're okay, if they're being treated well, and it's a lot mentally to deal with. It is a lot. When we got the emergency call, we had to be out of the station in two minutes. And it was in 9, 10 in the morning. We had to be at the destination within five minutes of receiving the call. From there, we had to immediately transport the patient to the hospital, get them checked in, and then we had to leave. So there, were, there was no time to worry about yourself during this. This was our one scene. Obviously, the patient wasn't in here, and you can't see anything, but this was inside of the ambulance when we had arrived on scene in emergency. For my legacy, I worked with Miss Ashley Lillard, who is a teacher here, and she was a former nurse. I conducted um, a donation drive for EMTs because most of the time burnout comes from not healing at home. You, you're always at work, you're always on call, you're always having to worry about somebody else rather than yourself. So I conducted a donation drive in which small blankets, little uh, stuffed animals, things that make work feel more like home, I donated them to the EMTs in Orange card so that way knew that the community does see them we do appreciate them and like we will never understand their uh, like how they are able to handle what they do here okay. For, okay. for future governor school students I would advise you to definitely do something that you feel very passionate about. Do not do something where you're going to hate it. If you are thinking about a certain profession and you have a profession in mind that you want to do, I would suggest doing a project in that because you don't want to get to college and be in a field where you truly don't enjoy yourself. And this is a great opportunity to explore if what you want to do in your life. And uh, what I learned about myself was that I do. I definitely, this is definitely the job for me. I feel very passionate about this topic and I feel very passionate about helping people. And I have decided that I am going to major in nursing. And like I said, procrastination, like everybody said, procrastination is, don't do it. It's, it really gets in the way, I promise you. This year and last year have been the worst for me because of procrastination. So just stay on top of your work and do it during the summer. It's so much easier. Your fall semester is so easy to just cruise through if you get your stuff done in the summer. And remember to have fun, enjoy yourself. This project, it seems very hard and tedious, but it's it's not, just enjoy yourself with it. Don't over stress yourself. seen it a lot this year in school. There are so many students who used to get straight A's and because of the COVID pandemic, burnout got everyone. And these are ways to look for if somebody is experienced burnout. It can lead to suicide, it can lead to drugs, alcohol abuse, anything. And it's important to know how to see that in somebody before it turns into a problem, how to get help with somebody. Yes. And five minutes to get there. 
which is why it was such a short amount of time to be able to revive. So when you're on random level, yes. what's the decision making process like? Like what what's the like second step of like making the Okay, so the first thing that happens is you're sitting there in a room It's like it's not like a fire alarm or anything. It's just like an alerting sound. And what you do is then on your screen it'll show like what type of emergency is, like what degree of an emergency it is. And from there is when like it'll like you decide the time you have to get there. But the head of the Lake of the Woods Fire and Rescue, he prefers all of his for no matter what type of emergency to be out of the door within two minutes to be on your way to the scene. And when you get to the scene, it's very quick. And for this time, we weren't able to, like, they told us the wrong destination of the patient. And so when we got there, we had to look for it. And it was a very fast paced like, look because we didn't know the specifics of the actual injury. I can tell this part because it's, this doesn't release any information, but a, a woman had fallen, and it was an older woman, so it was a very severe emergency. And so when we can't find her, it was very stressful because it was it was about 30 degrees outside and spraying on a cold, hard ground and like hitting her head. For the decision making process, was just making sure like we move her in any ways that would injure her neck, and like she was like able to keep her body temperature up because we had no idea how long she had been there. And so it was just very fast on like making sure her vitals were okay and like just getting her to the hospital. Any other questions? Also, y'all, this was my first ever governor's school presentation. Hi, my name is Stephen Manchi, and this is what I've been doing for the past year. This is my senior internship presentation about the best way for individuals to support local wildlife in their area and support wildlife centers that could also help out. So starting out, one of the biggest things for this project is that even if the world is becoming more eco-aware, there's been a lot of movements recently about trying to reduce car your carbon footprint. There's also more technology, and that's still causing a lot of plastic waste and O2 carbon emission into the air. So my goal is to just make it more easy for certain people to protect the environment in a lot of a better way than we do right now. And one of my main ways for doing that was finding the best way for, say, wildlife centers to protect wildlife. That's their job. So there are three main ways people try to help wildlife centers. One is by directly volunteering at a wildlife center. Two is to support them through either supplies and donations. And the third way is to just be more eco-aware in our everyday lives. So for my internship, I decided to focus on the first point and interned at Rockfish Wildlife Sanctuary. It's a wildlife center up in Shipman, and my mentor was Bree Hashem, super nice. So some, one of Rockfish's main goals is to try to educate people who come there about like 
about certain animals and how they could best help the environment. They do this through their education ambassadors. Certain animals that they have that can't be released into the wild due to either injuries or the fact that they were illegally owned by a pet, as a pet. So they use those to educate other people about how these animals work in like a natural environment. So some things I did while I was here is I was making food as shown here. I pr cleaned enclosures to try to keep them tidy for new animals that are coming. And I also cleaned the place just to keep it tidy. Some things I learned, one thing is how they catalog each patient they have to make it so that way they know if the patient is doing well, if it's doing poorly, and so that way they can know if it was released or in some cases passed away. For my community service, my goal was to make a website that will make it a lot easier for people make it a lot more accessible for people to contact a wildlife center so that way they could either donate funds or donate supplies or report an animal that could be harmed. I, so the, the website has links to multiple wildlife centers such as Rockfish, Richmond, Southwest Virginia, but it also has information about animals that can be found in, in in Virginia. These animals can has the genus species name whether the animal is endangered or not and if they are rabies vector so that way people can know what to do about them. And lastly for my research when I was talking about the three pillars earlier one of my main goals was to find out the which one was the best in certain scenarios. For example in the summer some wildlife centers can get upwards of around 150 patients at a time and during like a summer summer session it would be very beneficial for a wildlife center to have more volunteers however during the midst of a, like say a pandemic it could be a lot harder for people to volunteer and as there's going to be a lot more guidelines for example when i was going into my internship in order to work with any mammal, mammals, you would need a, a COVID vaccination. It also didn't help as when I did my internship, I did it in November. And at that time, there were maybe 20 to 30 patients at the wildlife center. So if I were to give any advice to any upcoming seniors or juniors or even sophomores, people have talked about how you should not procrastinate, do it earlier, take pictures, and manage your time well. And while I agree with all these, in my opinion, the most important thing is to communicate with your advisors. These people are here to help you. Communicate with your mentor, if anything, schedule changes, and communicate with your parents. During this project, I had a lot of times where I just did not feel sure about what I was doing, and I just needed moral support. and. They really helped me when I asked. For future plans, I plan on attending either JMU or Old Dominion University to probably to major in either ecological field studies or biochemistry, and also minor in music since that's something I just enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Like there, it's often just animals they happen to find in the wildlife, like opos opossums. I think there's a few snakes. Tur there was one, a Russian tortoise, I think, was one. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of wild stuff. <laughs> yeah. Without a license, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right.
when I at Rockfish, there were four four floor time full time employees, and I think around seven or eight volunteers who came in on like certain days. Yeah, that's that's more of like a Rockfish is more of a smaller location. If you went to a place such as like just the Wildlife Center of Virginia or Blue Ridge Wildlife, they would probably have mo both more patients and more employees. Yeah, my, my best guess for like why it dwindles down during uh, the like fall and winter is because more animals are just starting to go into hibernation. And since they're not a, out and about, they're less likely to get hit by cars. I did it. Yeah, I saw. Yeah.